Welcome back to class number four of Trading Psychology, Master Your Mind, Make Money. We will be looking at confirmation bias here. This is class four, so if you have not watched the other ones, I'd say go and do that, but especially watch class number three about deliberative and intuitive thinking because that's gonna play a role in this one and come up. And if you have you know, a reference point from there, this video is gonna just jive that much more with your mind. So with that being said, let's go to my desktop and get started. Welcome to my desktop. Let's get right into confirmation bias. Now, what is this shortcut? Well, step one here is there needs to be some sort of belief. Now, it can, doesn't have to be a belief. You can use other words. You could say assumption. You could say thought. But you do need some sort of mental thought, assumption, belief in place. And then step two, you're going to start to look just like that. Now, what is this going on? Well, I think this picture does a great job of showing what a confirmation bias is doing, right? It's getting you very narrow-minded, which allows for step three, which is this right here. You get sucked right in. It's a tractor beam, okay? It's literally just a thought or belief or assumption, and you're just locked in. You get sucked right in just like a tractor beam would. So what is this tractor beam? How is it created more specifically? Well, once a belief, assumption, thought is made, there are really two choices that you have moving forward. And this is not just for trading, this is essentially for anything in life in terms of how our brain works. But you can either do first, seek confirmation, which from a time perspective, certainly is gonna allow you to check that box because it's very, very efficient and easy. And assuming you've watched the pre previous classes, you see where all this is headed when you see this line of logic right here. But there is another choice that you could do, and that is seek out disapproval. But when it comes to the time aspect, no, 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 that, that's not very time efficient. And in fact, a lot of brain power is required and that becomes a whole lot more difficult. And again, you should see where all this is headed assuming you've watched those other videos because as a reminder, you gotta remember that sadly, even the littlest bit of brain power requirements, our mind will attempt to avoid. So our minds are not seeking after brain power requirements, our minds are seeking to avoid them. Now the question our brain absolutely hates is this, are you sure? Are you sure, right? You have a belief, you have a thought, and then you have to say, well, are you sure? Our brain does not like that, right? Just not three words, no, 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 not pleasant at all. Now why, why does our thinking hate the question? Well, again, we have not two choices, but two reasons. Reason number one, well, brain power is required as we just established. And then number two, our internal desire to feel good about ourselves, prompting us to desire to be right. Just basics right here, right? You've watched those other classes, you know that we crave, we desire to feel good about ourselves. And a good way to do that is, well, let's, let's just desire to be right, because if we're right, then that's gonna make us feel good about ourselves. Circular logic there, which is perfectly fine here in this situation. So because we hate this question, our thinking avoids it in two ways. First way, we just look for information that confirms what we already believe, right? What our thought already is, what our assumption is. And then second, information we find, we place a higher weight and emphasis on that data regardless of if it's justified, right? Because if we find information and that information confirms what we believe, we're just gonna put even more value on it. We're gonna put that much more weight on it, and in some sense, it's kinda like a snowball. We're gonna subconsciously build a snowball that just, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's all just confirming something, and then it just, you get the feeling, you get more confidence, you get more belief in it, dare I say, because you're putting all this extra emphasis on it, you're putting all this weight on it, and you're kind of building this almost brain snowball of confirmation. But how does this look in trading? Well, let's take a look at a couple of examples. So we have Tom the Trader here, and he, you know, he's a technical trader, he uses technical indicators, so he, believes that a trade looks good due to the RSI indicator, right? So the RSI is what he's looking at, which you can see there falls into the momentum category of technical indicators. And he says, okay, you know, I am aware, I'm aware of the importance of, of I gotta be asking myself that question. I don't like to, but I, but I need to. Are you sure? 
Now think about this, we are giving, I'm not taking a worst case scenario, and I do this because I wanna show just how tricky the brand can be, where even if you think you're doing it right, just as Tom the Trader does, because he's saying to himself, hey, I know about this question, I'm aware of its importance, so yeah, I'm gonna ask myself that question, even though I don't want to, are you sure? So in order to try to disprove himself, he checks another indicator just to be sure. So he goes and checks the stochastics. Now my question to you is, what do you notice about the stochastics? More specifically, what do you notice about the stochastics relative to the RSI? Maybe you're saying, well, well Clay, I noticed that they're both momentum indicators. Yes, exactly. Both indicators are in that same category. In other words, they are measuring the same characteristic in price action. It's that tractor beam. He's sucking himself in without even realizing that he's sucking himself in, which is definitely a whoopsie moment. We don't wanna be doing that. And in other words, you know, that picture, he's put on the blinders. Now in doing all this, he's turning all this is allowing to turn into a threat of overconfidence in a trade setup, right? Because he's starting to put way more emphasis on things. And he's doing that, and the cause of that is gonna be, wow, think back to the brain snowball. Oh, wow, even more. The R side, the stochastic look great. Boom, overconfidence. It is time to increase position size. Maybe he wants to give the trade more room to work, which increases his risk. And then even when negative elements start to show up, what, are, what is he gonna do? What do you think that Tom the Trader is gonna do when negative elements show up? Because he's very overconfident, right? He's, a, he's, he's just gonna ignore them. Now, why would he ignore them? Well, because he's putting way too much importance on that what confirms he's already right, right? In other words, to stick with the snowball analogy, you know that snowball has gotten way too big. So because the snowball is way too big and because, because he's putting too much importance on it, he don't care. Tom don't care, oh, that, that, that's kind of negative. Okay, that's not quite what I thought, but oh, this is a strong trade because I remember those momentum. And oh yeah, you know what else I remember? I asked myself the question, Tom, are you sure? So it's not like I took a shortcut because I answered that question. So yeah, some negative elements, but that's okay. That's okay, right? He's putting way too much emphasis on those dynamics. And because too much is importance is being placed, on what confirms that he's right, he's going to ignore it, which I'm sure you're well of, whereas we don't wanna be ignoring things like that in our trading. If things get element, or if, excuse me, if things get negative, you want to acknowledge them and deal with them as your trade plan, as your strategy says that you should. So let's take a look at another example, Tom. He sees this and he's like, wow, I believe the trade looks good due to the overall uptrend, which got to give Tom the trader credit or credit Sue. I would agree. The overall uptrend certainly looks good. But again, Tom the trader's like, hey, but you know what? I'm a good trader. I'm trying to be aware of my own psychology. So while I don't want to ask myself the question, I do understand the importance. I got to ask myself the question, well, well, Tom, are you sure? So he zooms in a bit and sees that the near-term trend is also well, it's also up. So right here, hey, both are saying up, but the problem is both are saying the same thing, right? The only difference here is he's just looking at a slightly different time period. So, all oh, right, yeah, overall tra trend is up, short-term trend is up, fantastic. So yes, I'm sure, and he reaches this right here being the final verdict that the stock is extremely strong and it's going up from all angles. So because it's going up from all angles, the stock is strong. But the truly not easy question that he should have been asking is this. Well, is it going to remain strong? Is there any reason to believe otherwise? Right, so you, do you see that the more in-depth question, not surface deep questions, and it's not necessarily surface deep, it's more of a surface deep response to the question. Make sure you're not in that tractor beam of just, sure, asking yourself, are you sure, but then just going out there and finding something that's gonna confirm what you already know. So right here, Tom the Trader chooses subconsciously, right? It, it's not like, which is what makes this hard, right? Because you don't really necessarily know that you're doing it, but he chooses subconsciously to not notice two non-confirming dynamics of the trade. So right here, he decides to, well, not do that. Now by doing that, he has drawn a rising wedge pattern, which is bearish. So think about that. All he had to do was draw in one more tread line. But his mind, again, to be fair to Tom and to be fair to you and to be fair to myself, because 
I'm guilty of all this too. But to be fair to all of us, I mean, yeah, he just, I, I don't really want to draw that top line because now I can't really say that the near-term trend is up because I, I have a rising wedge which is bearish. That's not good. But then something else, you know, looking at the MACD there, you can see that, sure, in the short term, that trend is up, which was one of his, one of his original claims. But looking at the MACD, you can see the MACD is going down, which in the world of technical trading, we would call a MACD negative divergence. Negative divergence is something that, again, implies that something is you know, not guaranteed because those don't exist, but in the realm of that more difficult question, is it going to remain strong? Well, this negative divergence is suggesting, yeah, you know, this thing might be running out of gas. You know, the price might be running out of energy, which is a big whoopsie because you're when you take that extra step further, you start to reveal some things and it's not a bad thing as we'll get to later on in the presentation. It, it's what we should be desiring, like I said, as I'll show. But you can see here that there was the trade or there was a setup when he didn't do anything, and then here is the rest of that story. So I mean, not totally shocking, was rising wedge, you had the negative divergence, and yeah, that rising wedge ultimately did create a movement right there. But this was all ignored, and how could it be ignored in this situation? So as this is happening, as these negative elements are showing up, well remember, what was Tom's final judgment verdict? This is a strong stock, all those trends were going up. So as these negative things are happening, what, what could he be doing? He's refusing to put in or honor a stop loss. Maybe he canceled the stop. Maybe he keeps moving his stop loss down and down and down. I mean, have you ever been there? I know I have, right? Because why? how is he justifying this? How is he, because he said, well, no, 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 none of this is, I've already confirmed this is a really strong stock. So this is just a little bit more of a pullback than what I thought, but because my mind has, I'm in the tractor beam of just saying that everything is strong because I've looked at a couple indicators. I've asked myself the question, are you sure? Yeah, it's actually strong. So let me just move my stop loss down a little bit more. Or maybe he's just buying more shares, right? Averaging down, buying more of a losing trade. Now, of course, in his mind, it's not necessarily a losing trade because, well, it's actually a strong stock. So this is right by the dip, right? He's buying that dip because, hey, everything's fine. Everything is fine. And he's doing all this because once again, too much importance is being placed on what confirms that he's already right. So that is the big problem. And this is the influence of intuitive thinking. So I hope you watched the previous class because this should all make a whole lot more sense because of that previous class. But let's just walk through it from the influence of in, uh, you know intuitive thinking. So you have a belief and find confirming indicators. This tells us that we are right and feeds our ego. And this food causes us to feel good. In other words, why? Well, because we are right. And being right makes us feel good and makes us, you know, feeling good feeds our ego. And that's just what we want to have. And then this leads to just making a very quick judgment, right? And then here we have from a time perspective, well, our answer comes quickly. So because our answer comes quickly, you know what? That must be right and I feel good about it, it came quickly, my ego, I'm, everything's good, but when you mix in that risk and uncertainty, you have that blind spot. Again, I realize that's all a review, but I just want to apply it to how this can you know, fit into, how it you know, filters into the confirmation bias. However, let's look at the power of deliberative thinking. So we have a quote here from George Soros, and just set aside, I know, a pretty decisive character within the world of politics, but we're not talking politics, we're talking trading, we're talking psychology. So set all those other things aside, but the way George Soros is, uh, you know, he approaches this, I am not a professional security analyst. I would rather call myself an insecurity analyst. So as it goes on to say, and as he explains, he knows he may be wrong, and that gives him a sense of insecurity, which keeps him alert. Constantly, so he's constantly looking for flaws in his position, which this is the part that just, I mean, wow. I don't think you can get any more insecure than this. Knowing, not thinking, not, not possibility, nothing like that. Knowing, well, knowing what? That they must exist, that what must exist? Flaws. So he is assuming the worst. He is assuming that flaws must exist within his trade plan. So. Once he finds the flaw in his trade, you know what? He can have more confidence about the trade. How so? Well, because he knows how he could be wrong and he's prepared for it. 
And that is the power. Earlier mentioned, there is power in not sugarcoating your own analysis, in being brutal with yourself. In fact, some could argue, well, geez, that, that's really bad thinking. That's like really negative thinking. We need to have positive thinking. We want positive vibes. But to sit there and say that you know, like you were giving yourself no credit at all. You were just not saying you think it's a possibility. There's a chance. No, no, you're saying you know that flaws exist. Yeah, that's the argument here. Because when you take that, you're going to search for them. You're going to find flaws, which doesn't mean you freak out. But it should give you confidence because, again, it shows you how Things can go wrong, which when you know things, how can go wrong, right? Logic would then dictate, okay, well, therefore, I know how to prepare for it because I know what could go wrong. And a great quote here, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And this all seems very counterintuitive because again, how do you prepare as traders in terms of confirmation bias? You prepare with a negative attitude of saying, all right, I know there's flaws out there, let's find some of these flaws. And by doing that, you are actually preparing. So yes, in a weird way, by being negative towards yourself, towards your trade plan, you are therefore preparing for the best. And maybe that doesn't sound, uh, you know, a whole lot of sense school or common sense school, but it truly is, especially if you already have, uh, you know, if, if you've been around the market and have traded. So you overcome the, this by just having a negative attitudes towards yourself and assuming that you do indeed have those flaws. And by doing so, you can find them. By finding them, you can have more confidence because you will be prepared for them because you already know how things go wrong before they actually even do. And that's definitely what preparation is all about. So there we go, get negative. Know that you have flaws in your trade plan. And as you saw, that will ultimately, in the end, lead for you to be prepared and be confident in what you're doing. So I hope this helps. I hope you have um, you know, a, a good, I guess, negative approach to things from here on out. And I'll see you back in class number five.